G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Then I've got a quick video that deals with key scheduling in Revit. Um, so this is a really handy technique that not a lot of people actually seem to use or even know about. So I thought I'd share it with you. Um, so what are they? Well, they essentially give you many ways of controlling, locking down and delimiting the data that you can apply to elements in your model. This could be, for example, the orientation of a window. Obviously, you'd only really wanna let people say maybe one of four orientations. A key schedule allows you to delimit this as well. Now there's other uses that I'll show you, such as locking down the values of elements based on a single key. It's also on the roadmap. Um, currently key schedules do not support shared parameters as values that you can lock in using a relevant key. But on the, uh, the Revit roadmap, um, hopefully soon this will be something that is possible. And I think that once this is integrated, um, key schedules will probably be used in a more widespread fashion because obviously a lot of companies, they use um, shared parameters. Oh, so many notifications these days. <laughs> Sorry. So today's context model I'm gonna be using is actually just a, a basic house that I've set up using a simplified version of my template, um, all of which can be found on my online store over at BIM Guru if you're looking for it too. Anyway, um, let's just dive straight in and get started. Okay, so I'm here in um, my sample basic project um, and I'm just gonna go to 3D and just show you how I've set up the keys. I'm just gonna turn off my Enscape layer just by changing phase. Um, so in this case, there's a couple of key schedules I've already set up in this project, for example. Um, one of them relates to windows. So the windows have been given a key value of their orientation. I've also got one that controls the type of glazing the window contains and also the frame type. Now you could make these free text fields where the user types whatever they want. But a key schedule in this case um, gives us a way to limit the data. So when I drop this down, you can see I only have four options available. And if I type something outside the possibility of the option, such as down, so obviously not a good orientation, you can see it doesn't allow the population of that value. Um, so this is a really handy way to limit the data that's possible to populate. Now, how have I set this up? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is just get rid of this key. So I have a window schedule for keys um, that deals with the orientation. Now, keep in mind that key schedules are a bit of an all-in approach. If you do use them and then you delete the key schedule, the key disappears and any values that were set by that key are also removed, even if they were parameters that were there before the key was. So you do have to be really careful that you protect your key schedules. Usually I recommend using a browser organization uh, that does give you the option to sort your key values. For example, here I'm using a parameter for the user to specify um, how the key values are sorted in the browser. And then I put them all under one area. So I'm, I'm controlling them just using a shared parameter that I've applied to schedules and on a text basis. Okay, but as soon as I get rid of orientation windows, the key is gone. And so is that value. So you do need to be careful. Anyway, let's actually create this key schedule. So I'm gonna go to view, schedules, schedules and quantities, and I'm gonna find the category that I wanna assign the key to, in this case, windows. Um, I'll just call this uh, my syntax, so I use a star key, and then I'll just call this orientation. And usually I put in brackets what the category is. That way the user on face value has a good understanding of what the key is doing. Then you click on schedule keys and you give a name to the key and you can rename this later, so don't worry if you get it wrong, um, but it's good to obviously get it right first. So I'm just gonna say orientation as the name of the key. I'm gonna okay that. Now at this point, you can add other fields sometimes that the key can control. In the case of Windows, you don't really have a lot of options, um, but you can add project parameters, which keys can control. Uh, but as I said before, shared parameters are currently not available um, in Revit itself. It's, it's an upcoming feature, apparently. Uh, fingers crossed. It's on the roadmap, so that's a good sign. Anyway, we're just gonna say, okay. Um, and you get an empty schedule. So a bit confusing, like what's the point of the schedule right now? But if you click on the schedule and you just start inserting data rows, we're essentially adding keys um, to the schedule. So we can rename these to North, South, East, and West. Now, if I go back to my model and I select this window, I now have a key under identity data for orientation. Um, I can change this in this case. I can pick East, North, South, or West. Um, so now I can just basically isolate all my windows 
select all my south fender facing windows choose south find all my my east facing windows make them east all my north and I can set them to north and likewise east ah oh, sorry west what am I doing <laughs> So super simple. Um, and then as a result, you can also go to things like actual schedules, like a window schedule, and you can add this field. So after glazing, I can also add the key, uh, should be orientation. And now we've captured that key value as well. And if you're in the schedule too, you're also limited to what you can pick. Um, so it's a really handy little schedule if you have a set of data that you want your users to work with. Now, another function of key schedules is using the key to lock in pre-existing parameters. A really good example of this is room finish schemes, um, which is usually what I've been using key schedules for in the past. So if I go to a floor plan and I select one of my rooms, such as this media room, you'll see in this case that my name and my finishes are grayed out, they're locked. And this is because I've created a finish scheme. I'm also using the finish scheme to drive the name of the room in this case. Um, because it's a residential project, usually the room names are very predictable. Um, houses typically only have a preset possibility of the types of rooms they tend to contain. So what I actually have is a key schedule for rooms um, that is set up for finishes. And you can see here my key name is the name of the room. And I've added parameters that pre-exist, but we're going to set this up again. Um, keep in mind, this is obviously going to be an example of when losing a key schedule is very destructive. Um, because not only am I going to lose all those finish values, I'm also going to lose the names of the rooms. So as soon as this is gone, we're going to actually lose a bit of data, I believe. Um, in this case, yeah, so if I take my room tag and I move it, um, you can see that the room tag now understands that there are no, no values on these elements. Um, so it's pretty destructive if you lose the key schedule um, or if you don't understand the values are being mapped using a key schedule. We're going to recreate this. So I'm going to make a schedule and quantities for rooms. And again, I'm just going to go asterisk key. I'm going to say finishes rooms. I'm going to make it a schedule keys and I'll just call this a finish scheme. And in this case, you can actually add a few of the system parameters that exist already for these things, such as name, occupancy, and the various finish fields. In this case, uh, maybe I'll keep the name out um, just because that's something I do in a very particular type of project. But at the very least, we can add the base, ceiling, floor, and wall finish. And we can set up some basic finish schemes by adding some data rows. I'll just zoom in a bit. And let's just say we've got um, typical uh, wet areas Let's just, let's just have two finish schemes, actually. That's probably enough. Um, and we can say the typical base finish, which is the skirting, is timber. The typical ceiling uh, can just be plasterboard. The typical floor can be carpet. And the typical wall can be painted. <laughs> Sorry, some cats going crazy in the background. Um, what areas we can say the base finish is tiled skirting. The ceiling is, again, plasterboard. The floor is tiled. And the wall finish is painted slash tiled. So it's a bit of both. Now keep in mind, this is just data. This isn't locking in any modeling conditions, but it's a good way to sort of lay out a brief for your rooms before you get too detailed into your modeling process. For example, during a schematic phase, maybe you just want to schedule what the room finishes are and then use the room areas to tally <laughs> the total quantity of finishes. Got kitty smack down in the background. Um, so let's just go back to this media room. Now, obviously, I have to go and tell this thing it's a media room again manually because I disabled the keys control of that. But what I can do at least is pick uh, my typical finish scheme. And now you can see all those values have been populated. In this case, my room tag actually also includes the floor finish field. Um, let's go to a wet area such as this powder room. And I'm going to call this uh, PDR for powder. And for the scheme, I'm going to pick wet areas. And now you can see we've populated all those fields. Um, but obviously you can do things really quickly. Like I can just isolate all my rooms. Um, I'll just say they're all finished scheme one. And then I can just unisolate and just isolate just the wet areas. Uh, and obviously there's a few more schemes I'd probably need in this type of model. But very quickly, I've just went and mass populated all my finished data in my floor plan. Um, with a few clicks. So a key schedule does give you much more mass control over what you're doing. And obviously too, if your finish scheme changes, rather than having to go find all those rooms that the finish scheme relates to, 
we now just have our key schedule available. So we can just go and change that. Let's say the client wants to replace carpet with timber. Well, we just change it in our key. And now all of our rooms that were carpet are now timber. Um, again, obviously the model hasn't picked up that change. It's just a data thing, but it's very handy for early phase of design when you just want to get rough tallies based on the data by room. Um, so hopefully this has been a handy technique uh, to add to your Revit toolbox. Um, it definitely helps me uh, a lot on a on a day to day basis. Um, so I'll just quickly boot up my presentation again. That seems to have fallen fallen off. Um, yeah, but but hopefully that helps you and gives you a new technique. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed that. And uh, and if you have any comments about how might you might want to use key schedules, feel like, feel free to leave it down below. I know engineers use this. Uh, sometimes to control the base quantities of outlets and return and supply outlets in spaces uh, at the early phases of design before they start modeling. Because obviously data is sometimes enough for them to do schematics and um, look at the building at a very high level. Um, so thanks for watching today. If you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.